Hello everyone, Dr. Alex Vasquez here with video number four about our upcoming international conference on human nutrition and functional medicine to be held here in beautiful Portland, Oregon, September 25th through the 29th. In video number one, I provided an overview of the conference and an introduction to the city of Portland and the Pacific Northwest region of the United States. Here's our convention center, which you can see is located right next to the Willamette River. Many of you will come in through Portland's International Airport. We've got plenty to do here in Portland. A little bit to the west, we've got the Oregon coast, very beautiful as you can see here. And a little bit to the east by about 30 minutes, we have the Columbia River Gorge, which is the home of the Multnomah Falls area, as you can see here. Back in Portland again, plenty to do, lots of nice parks. In video number two, I discussed mitochondrial dysfunction and its relevance to modern clinical practice. You know, anytime these days we're treating hypertension, diabetes, migraine headaches, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, we need to be aware of the role that mitochondrial dysfunction is playing in those conditions. Of course, we're going to spend an entire day on that topic, Friday actually, of the conference, discussing assessments for mitochondrial dysfunction, the clinical presentation of it, and most importantly, in my opinion, how to actually treat and improve mitochondrial dysfunction for better clinical outcomes. Speaking of assessing and treating, in video number three, I discussed asking better questions in order to come up with better answers for not only our clinical practice, but ultimately, of course, our patients. So what I did there is walked you through kind of a case evaluation where a patient had come to my practice after being seen and evaluated by some other practitioners and how I provided a more in-depth assessment which I do believe will ultimately lead us to a better outcome. So recently on our Facebook page uh, and this was actually something that actually spawned out of my clinical practice recently. Last week I had a very very interesting case related to vitamin B12 deficiency and because of that of course I looked at a lot of research on B12 and then I posted some questions on our Facebook page relevant to the clinical management of B12 status, specifically B12 deficiency. When we look at nutrients, and we're going to just use B12 here as an example, but what I'm saying here actually applies kind of across the board to the field of nutrition. We can look at nutrition in a couple of different ways, or strata as we might say, or different layers. We can look at nutrition from the perspective of basic nutrition. We can look at nutrition from the perspective of clinical nutrition. And then we can go beyond that and talk about what many of us refer to now as functional nutrition. Now we can actually take a step beyond that, of course, into what I'm referring to here as advanced functional nutrition. So what I'd like to do here is start the exploration of the subject of vitamin B12 by looking at some basic nutrition concepts and some clinical nutrition concepts. And then perhaps in another video, which will provide us more time, we can go into more functional nutrition and advanced functional nutrition. So again, because Facebook limits the videos to only 20 minutes, uh, I'll try to limit this conversation to, of course, less than 20 minutes, and we'll follow up with more details on a subsequent video. Many of you have already used our first option for registration, which is our online automated system. Number two, you can always send in a check with the registration form. And number three, you can call us and we'll try to process your registration over the phone. Something that's going to come around pretty soon are our pre-conference notes. And a lot of the material that we're going to discuss in this conversation about D B12 is actually included in the pre-conference notes. So within the pre-conference notes, I have an entire section on laboratory assessment, which of course touches on basic labs like CBC, chemistry panel, thyroid assessment, but it also goes into functional laboratory testing such as intestinal permeability and stool analysis, for example, and I've got a lot of case reports in there showing you how I've used that data in my own clinical practice. Uh, again, B12 is a very kind of enigmatic nutrient. Uh, there's been a lot of confusion about how to test it, how to treat for it, things like that. You can see here I've got a really interesting case of B12 deficiency in a patient that I saw several years ago when I was working in a community uh, based uh, family medicine clinic. We'll go through some details of that case in just a moment. And again here in this chapter I've got an entire section uh, again not only on lab tests in general but in particular uh, relevant to uh, assessing and treating B12 deficiency. So let's look at some of the questions. These were all posted on Facebook and we're going to start the process now of going through 
these questions kind of uh, again sequenced from basic nutrition to clinical nutrition to functional nutrition and then to advanced functional nutrition. So the first question I asked was what are the three main clinical presentations or categories of vitamin B12 deficiency when we're appreciating that in our patients? Number one, we all know that B12 deficiency eventually can lead to an anemia. It's what we call a macrocytic anemia. So not only are there too few red blood cells eventually, but they also become larger. That's what we mean by macrocytic large cell anemia. And that's you know one of the classic presentations. But my major point in talking about anemia in this context is to say that not all patients with B12 deficiency will present with anemia. I recall when I was doing my family medicine internship, we had a, a debate, I suppose, or more honestly, it was a disagreement about a patient who I thought was B12 deficient and my attending physician said, no, if there's no anemia, the patient cannot be B12 deficient. And that's absolutely incorrect. And I'll show you a case of that in just a moment. So this is just assessed with a CBC, which stands for complete blood count. Uh, and that's just a basic laboratory test that all doctors do. The th second presentation of B12 deficiency is peripheral neuropathy. So patients will often complain of either burning in their peripheral extremities, their hands and feet, or numbness and tingling in their extremities, or they won't have any complaints, and we have to discover the peripheral neuropathy on physical exam. Third area of B12 deficiency presentation is neurocognitive and psychiatric. Anything from fatigue to a motivation to apathy to anhedonia, which just means not having pleasure in life, to bipolar disorder, to extreme psychosis and catatonia. So those are the three main presentations of B12 deficiency clinically. Anemia, peripheral neuropathy, and neurocognitive psychiatric presentations. Now, patients don't come in with all three of those at the same time. Some of them only present with anemia, others only present with peripheral neuropathy, others only present with neurocognitive and psychiatric presentations. So patients don't have to have the complete picture to have a very severe deficiency. Now, of these three categories of B12 deficiency presentation, uh, perhaps obviously, the most important are the neurocognitive and psychiatric because B12 deficiency can lead to permanent brain damage if the deficiency is not uh, assessed and corrected promptly. So basically we think of nerves, blood, and brain. Now let's look at some research which I think you'll find very interesting. In the nutrition world, doctors have used vitamin B12 empirically or, and or routinely in the treatment of patients who have neuropsychiatric complaints, again, whether that's fatigue or a, a more formal diagnosis such as bipolar or schizophrenia, and you'll see some cases of catatonia here in just a moment. So here's a case of a patient who presented with this neuropsychiatric syndrome probably looked like kind of schizophrenia, which can have the manifestation ultimately of catatonia. And it turned out to just be a B12 deficiency. What would have happened if this patient hadn't been diagnosed and treated for B12 deficiency? The patient would have probably been institutionalized, could have suffered permanent brain damage due to the nutritional deficiency. So it was kind of a matter of sheer luck, as it often is, when these patients are diagnosed appropriately and treated with the nutrient that they need. Let's look at another case right here. Catatonia and other psychiatric symptoms with B12 deficiency. Very interesting case here of a 52-year-old woman who was a lifelong vegetarian and just started to decline, as we sometimes say in medicine, became progressively more fatigued, developed some unusual symptoms. We'll look at this case in more detail in just a moment, but was ultimately treated for psychosis with drugs, electroconvulsive therapy, uh, and Luckily for her, eventually she was diagnosed with the causative B12 deficiency. She was treated with B12 and, of course, returned back to normal life. So as I've already alluded, what happens when patients with B12 deficiency are not diagnosed and treated? Well, here's an example of a patient that I saw in that family medicine clinic many years ago. He was not anemic, but if you can look at the bottom, towards the bottom of the page, you'll see that his B12 level was very, very abnormally low. So this patient was actually starting to develop some neurocognitive and peripheral nerve problems 
I recall that his main problem was unsteadiness of gait. So this was an elderly man who was starting to have to use a cane and a walker because he was losing his balance. And I said, why don't we test him for B12 deficiency? And as you can see here, that turned out to be the, the correct answer by asking the right question. Not just saying, oh, well, he's an older patient. He's just starting to decline. He needs a walker or a cane. You know, a lot of these patients, as they get older, they do start to decline, but it's not because of their age and it's not because of disease. It's because of undiagnosed and untreated nutritional deficiencies. So anemia, weakness, fatigue, numbness, tingling, and the diagnosis of neuropathy. How do we treat neuropathy in most medical practices? We just give patients drugs. But in that case, we'd actually be masking the manifestations of a treatable problem, namely B12 deficiency in this case. Depression, dementia, psychosis, and brain damage are the neuropsychiatric manifestations and consequences of B12 deficiency. But what if patients aren't diagnosed and treated for B12 deficiency? They suffer. And as I already said, they're just drugged and treated medically, which often compounds the suffering. So let's look at this patient who had the B12 deficiency. She's got negative affect. She developed uh, some unusual behaviors. She became incontinent of stool and urine, which means she uh, couldn't control her bowel and bladder. She was administered electroconvulsive therapy. Her, she had some laboratory abnormalities. She eventually uh, entered into a stupor state, which is being kind of semi-conscious and minimally responsive. She had poor sleep, poor appetite, hypochondriacal uh, preoccupations, and unusual motor movements. You can see here uh, anxiety about her household, uh, frequent crying, purposeless uh, upper extremity movements. So, you know, none of those are consistent with uh, enjoyable quality of life. I mean, this woman is kind of, uh, not to sound overly dramatic, but she's kind of disintegrating. I mean, her life is falling apart simply because she's got this B12 deficiency. So, you know, I, I think we owe it to all of our patients to really assess them and assess their nutritional status and not leave them in such a debilitated state and then you know presume that the correct answer is well they're just developing mental illness or they need more drugs or they need electroconvulsive therapy let's at least start by asking the right questions and looking at their nutritional status so what are the means for assessing b12 deficiency well we can always look at history Sometimes patients have a history of intestinal disease that would lead to malabsorption. Maybe they've got a history consistent with malnutrition. And so overall, we just look at the clinical picture. On physical exam, we can look for pallor as a sign of anemia. We can look for peripheral neuropathy. We can obviously do psychiatric and mental status uh, assessments. But the goal there isn't to rush to a diagnosis to then prescribe the quote unquote appropriate drug. We need to understand that a lot of the psychiatric manifestations that we see in clinical practice, again, ranging from fatigue to depression to sometimes a diagnosable mental illness, can be the result of nutritional deficiencies. As far as labs go, we can do serum B12. It's not very reliable. So typically what we say about that is it's important if it's low, but it's pretty much worthless if it's normal or high. It doesn't really tell you about the functional status of that nutrient. It doesn't tell you anything about blood-brain barrier transport. So some nutrients, in order to get from the blood into the brain, they have to go through a somewhat complex blood-brain tr transport mechanism. Now there are three nutrients that are affected most typically by a defective blood-brain barrier transport mechanism. Those nutrients are vitamin B12, folic acid, and iron. So in some patients, their blood levels of the nutrient will be normal, but their brain levels of the nutrient will be low. Again, that's been diagnosed and uh, well documented in the medical literature for B12, folic acid, and iron. Methylmalonic acid is another test we can use, and of course we can look at homocysteine as well. But what's the whole point of doing any of those tests? What's the goal? Is the goal to reach a diagnosis or is the goal to improve function and treat the patient? Well, for me, I've always said, because I do teach a course in laboratory assessment, what I say is no one ever got healthier from getting a lab test. Patients only get better when we treat them. 
So, very consistent with that idea, which I've espoused for many years, let's look at this article published in Blood, a very well-respected hematology journal published by the American Society of Hematology, as you can see here. Very excellent article looking at cobalamin responsive disorders in the ambulatory care setting, unreliability of cobalamin, meaning serum B12, methylmalonic acid, and homocysteine testing. So the ultimate conclusion of this article is when you see a patient who you think is B12 deficient, the most clinically efficacious means of diagnosing and treating them at the same time is to give them a therapeutic trial of vitamin B12. So then the question becomes, well, how do we do that? So what are the supplemental forms of vitamin B12? What are the advantages and disadvantages of each? We could then go on to talk about routes of administration. We could then go on to talk about monitoring, etc. But let's start here. One of the forms of vitamin B12 that's commonly available in health food stores, for example, and as an injectable is called cyanocobalamin. So B12, the, the root of B12 is the cobalamin molecule. So in this case, it's cobalamin with cyanide attached to it. It's uh, widely available. It's the most inexpensive form. But the problem is it contains cyanide, and I think we all appreciate that cyanide is a mitochondrial poison. And it is relevant. It's relevant especially for older patients, and it's particularly relevant for people who smoke because tobacco smoke contains a significant amount of cyanide and if we were to compound that by giving someone cobalamin, uh, cyanocobalamin, we would be giving them extra cyanide, which of course could lead to particularly neurologic complications. So another form of B12 is hydroxycobalamin. It happens to be my favorite form of cobalamin. Another form is adenosylcobalamin, and another is methylcobalamin. Now, in another presentation, I'll tell you why I think hydroxycobalamin has some very specific clinical advantages. But that's when we get into the conversation of what we're going to call functional nutrition and eventually advanced functional nutrition. So when we start to talk about the meta-nutritional effects of nutrients, so meta is just a prefix that just means beyond. So we're talking about the beyond nutritional effects of nutrients. So we can use nutrients not necessarily as drugs, but perhaps by using another term uh, that was popular many years ago called biological response modifiers. So we can change physiologic function by using high dose nutrients in ways that really have nothing to do with the basic nutritional role that that nutrient might typically play. So for example, when we think of B12, we think of blood, brain, and nerves. Well, B12 can do a lot of things beyond blood, brain, and nerves. It can also bind on to toxic elements and free radicals like nitric oxide, hydrogen sulfide, cyanide. So we can use B12 not simply as a nutrient, but actually as a therapeutic agent. Again, binding hydrogen sulfide, the sulfite ion, uh, also nitric oxide, and cyanide. So those are meta-nutritional effects of nutrients. So we'll talk about those things in a future presentation. Again, it's all mentioned within the pre-conference notes that will be available soon, and in other conversations we'll go through the rest of these questions. So again, in other presentations we'll talk about functional nutrition, advanced functional nutrition, and those are just some of the things that I thought you might be interested in relevant to the conversation on B12. So we look forward to seeing you here in beautiful Portland, Oregon, and I will post this video on Facebook as soon as I get it processed. Look forward to seeing you all there, and take care until then.